Good morning. Good morning to everybody. So Good glad morning. that we are here. So glad we're together. Thank the Lord that um, my mama is now no longer. Last night on the airplane, she said, what am I going to do? We're, we're two hours into the flight. We had about 30 minutes left. And she um, was wanting to give cards out to people who were sitting around us. And I said, Mom, I don't know that you can interrupt them, but I think we can, you know. So she she was, she was did fine. He handled it when she took, you know, she said, you want my card? And he took it, and it was sweet. And then uh, a few minutes later, she said, what can I do? This is my last night of being 72. And uh, in the airplane, all of a sudden, she said, hallelujah! And that was, I was like, all right, you can do that. And so they didn't kick us off. Did and, not. and it was okay. And we were... Um, weren't met by the U.S. Marshals when we were done, and nobody was done. Um, so thank the Lord for that. But uh, we flew up to New York this week and um, got to see family, and that was a blessing. Um, hold the baby, that was a blessing. So, And we're home today. We're going to have a good day together. It is our Pastor Appreciation Day, and it's also Mama's birthday, which is a wonderful um, coinciding date, and we're so appreciative that the Lord's brought us all here together. We um, are having dinner after this, but um, before we have dinner and before we, um, you know, have celebrating of all of that, we're going to have church together. And I'm so glad that the Lord allows us to come together and worship Him. Um, sometimes when you're in the world and you're walking around and you're just functioning, you realize, man, I can't wait to get back to church to feel the Lord's presence with my brothers yeah. and sisters. Thank you, sir. And I tell you what, we are blessed to have the people we have sitting in this building this morning. And I'm so appreciative. We're blessed to have our remote saints that are out there too. Brother George, we're so glad that you're with us and we love you. And um, we're glad for a lot of people that are we haven't even met that follow us every week and or watch us after their services. Thank you for that. Um, we're going to take a prayer request this morning before we go to Sunday school. This morning we'll just be having online. We'll just have for the Don's class. The children have something they're working on um, for the day. So that would be separate. So we're going to do that this morning. But before we do that, we are going to take up prayer requests and um, go ahead and go to the Lord and um, trust Him for all of our needs to be met. Does someone have something they need to pray about? We need to pray for Danny, Sister Marcia's son. I haven't heard anything this morning, but yesterday she said he was really bad off. He had a motorcycle wreck, and someone ran into him. I don't know what his wreck at this point. Somebody ran into him, but please pray for Danny. He, he needs the Lord so bad. He isn't saved. Remember Danny. Yes. And remember Sister Marcia. I know this is hard, really hard on her. Yes. I know for her about her son. <coughs> the whole family. Yes. The people that we met in New York a few times ago, that the lady that played the flute, um, her husband is um, unconscious and intubated in the hospital. Her um, brother, Hal, and sister, um, okay. Elaine. Elaine. Um, and she is on oxygen 24 hours a day and needs the Lord to move. They need a miracle in Brother Howell's life, and we need a miracle in the Wooten's life that the Lord would touch them, the Church of God pastors that Mom grew up under, and I did too. Let's remember then that the Lord would continue to heal um, them completely. And um, in all of that, that the Lord and everyone that's fighting anything, that the Lord would draw them closer to Him and that it would work the work that it needs to work in their lives. Because sometimes that is the greater need, is whatever he wants to do in your life, that he would do it. Something else, anyone else? Go ahead. Um, a friend of mine, a former co-worker, Kevin Figger, passed away a week ago and uh, aspirated pneumonia. And uh, I just remember his wife, Mary, and his family. He was uh, a bit younger than I was, so Kevin Vickers family. Kevin Vickers family. Mary. His wife, Mary. <coughs> Somebody else. Gloria. Just um, please pray for my Okay. 
parents remember people who are out of school right now. Someone else. Remember our children, Megan, Katie, and Melissa, and also uh, Ray Mount. There's just some changes going on in my job. Just pray for the power. Remember Brother Kevin's job and their children say something else. Remember Angela and Jason and their family. Remember that the Lord would help and all of Sister Annie's family, but I just think about them. They are um, part of us. We're so blessed to have them. Remember Daniel and Nina and all the children. Somebody else. Remember Sister Cherie and Elin and Sister Dory that has followed us from afar. Her pastor is very sick with COVID, and there are about 20 people. They are, their church had it about a, six months to a year ago, and 20 or so had it, and now 20 or so have it again. And the pastor has double pneumonia and is very, very sick with it. And he also has um, diabetes, so he's at great risk, I believe, he's in the hospital. So please remember Sister Dory's pastor and all of her church, and that they would be safe and not get it, um, that the Lord would help her. You want to remember Sister Connie and Brother Tim Akers too. They are pastoring, and but they're off and on there having problems, with, you know, physical problems. So we ought to remember them and their church. They support our church, and we appreciate them very much. Yes. And also uh, remember Brother and Sister Cooper and yes. their family. They yes. they help us a lot too. The Akers actually sent, um, and we might have to get it, but we um, they sent an entire box of peanut brittle for um, everyone in the church. So there's a bag of peanut brittle that the acres sent to our church and they wanted to make sure that everyone got one. So that's a blessing. It was really sweet. I don't, they just wanted to. They just said, said how much they appreciate us. And so thank the Lord for them, that the Lord would heal them and strengthen them. Somebody else. All right, unspoken, Sister Dan. Oh, remember all my family. Um, Thompson is doing better. He did have to get like, I guess you say 13 stitches mm -hmm. when he fell. And so just pray for all that. It's, it's a whole thing. And then um, remember Casey, um, Jose's cousin, Alfred's wife. She um, She's not due until March. I believe she's not due to have a baby until March. But she's having to take it easy because she's having preterm labor. Okay. So just really just pray for her. All right. Remember Alfred's wife, Casey, and the baby. Anybody else? Remember Carlos. That the Lord would heal her. I need healing. Remember Olivia and Brian and Riley. Yes. Remember Olivia and Brian and Riley. Somebody else. All right, any unspoken requests? Let's go to the Lord and pray, trusting and knowing He's going to answer. God bless you, Lord, to all the country, all the freedom to see your kindness to us. Lord, you said, Lord, call unto me and I will answer thee and show thee great and mighty things. We call unto thee this morning, Lord.
Samuel, yes, ma'am. Um, where we left off was somewhere in the end of chapter 10. So if you want to just put your finger in there, that would be great. And what we talked about was we we're talking about the life of Saul. And um, when we left off, Saul, the people wanted a king, right? They wanted an earthly king. And we saw a scripture, we read a scripture in Deuteronomy back in Moses' time, 400 years before Saul was anointed king, where the Lord is telling Moses that the people are going to demand that you put a person king in front of them. So 400 years before Samuel anoints Saul as king, God had already told Moses that they would have a, a person king. Right? And we tied all that together. And we're going to start looking at this. And, and Saul, <clears throat> we talked about some of the qualities of Saul and how he was he was a young man. He was big, strong, right, good looking, you know. And if you wanted to have a, an earthly king, you'd be a good one, right? Because yeah, he looked the part, right? <laughs> big, strong, warrior kind. And then, and then when he's called or starts to get called, he goes and hides. And, and we talked about how he was, he was humble. He didn't believe that somebody of his lineage, of the tribe of Benjamin, of the house of Kish, was worthy of being the king over all of Israel. But Samuel said, no, you're, you're the one. And, he, and they did the, the casting lots, and they chose by family, and it went all the way down through Benjamin, through Kish, and through to Saul. And then he went looking for him, and he was hiding, right? And, and when we, in verse 5 of chapter 12, you'll flip over there. <clears throat> or we'll start at verse 1. And Samuel said unto all Israel, Behold, I have hearkened unto your voice in all that ye said unto me, and have made a king over you. And now, behold, the king walketh before you, and I am old and gray-headed, and behold, my sons are with you, and I have walked before you from my childhood until this day. Behold, here I am, witness against me before the Lord and before his anointed. Whose ox have I taken, or whose ass have I taken, or whom have I defrauded? Whom have I oppressed? Of whose, whose hand have I received any bribe to blind mine eyes therewith? And I will restore it to you. And they said, Thou hast not defrauded us, nor oppressed us, Neither has it have, have taken aught of any man's hand. In verse 5 he says, And he said unto them, The Lord is witness against you, and his anointed is witness this day, that ye have not found aught in my hand. And he answered, He is witness. And then he goes on to talk about Moses and how they fought, and then through the judges, and um, how he delivered uh, them out of the hand of Sisera and the Philistines. And all that was done when God was their king. They did all these wonderful... What he's trying to tell them is, I did all these great things for you. You didn't need a man king. You didn't need an earthly king. But because you've desired it, verse 13 says, Now therefore behold the king whom ye have chosen, and whom ye have desired. And behold, the Lord hath set a king over you. 
And says, if you will fear the Lord and serve him and obey his voice and not rebel against the commandment of the Lord, then shall both ye and also the king that reigneth over you continue following the Lord your God. Then verse 15 starts with a bad word. It says, but. That word, but and however, changes things, right? It says, but if you will not obey the word of the Lord. I'm sorry. Yeah voice of the Lord, but rebel against the commandment of the Lord, then shall the hand of the Lord be against you as it was against your fathers. And later he says, and, and judgment will come upon you and upon your king. <clears throat> so, when, when Saul starts out, I mean, Saul was just like a farm boy kind of person, right? I mean, he wasn't anything. He was going around looking for his daddy's donkeys that were missing, you know. And almost overnight, Saul was the most popular figure in all of Israel. Millions of people. And he went in, into that, role and responsibility seriously. He he was doing what he knew to do and what things Samuel had told him was things for him to do and the things that God would show him. Um, flip over to verse 13. Chapter 13. Saul reigned one year and when he had reigned two years over Israel Saul chose him 3,000 men of Israel whereof two thousand were with Saul at Mishmash and in Mount Bethel, and a thousand were with Jonathan and Gibeah of Benjamin. And the rest of the people sent he every man to his tent. <clears throat> so he built an army. Right? If you're a king, you've got to build an army. Now if you remember, God told through Samuel, told the people, well, he's going to take your sons and your daughters, and he's going to make them his servants. Well, here's 3,000 of them. He's taken them already. He hasn't been in the throne a year. And now they're all in the infantry. Did, didn't need to do that when God was your king. Right? They didn't have a standing army. God took care of it. God smote the walls of Jericho. God took care of it through the judges. And Saul starts to have these very decisive victories against the Philistines at Geba. And he, he says, verse 4, And all Israel heard say that Saul had smitten the garrison of the Philistines, and that Israel also was had an abomination with the Philistines. And the people were called together after Saul to Gilgal. <clears throat> so 3,000 people in the army they got a victory people had confidence in their new king hey he's already getting stuff done that's good the first hundred days isn't that what they say in the elections how's he doing after the first hundred days Saul's doing good right we talked about Saul's life is on a roof line so he's on the way up that roof line and he's going to reach a point here shortly where he makes a bad decision and he starts down the back side of that roof line. And he gets this endorsement from Samuel. Hey, your king's doing really good. He gave him a whole speech in front of the people. We can't forget, though, the outline of this whole story is this tragic ending, right? So we're not there yet. We're not at the, at the peak of that roof yet. This is the roof line. Saul is moving upward to his peak. His... And really, Saul becomes a victim of himself. Saul's undoing is all Saul's undoing. It's his fault. He, he knows the things that he's supposed to do that are right. But pride and impatience and rebellion, jealousy... 
even gets to the point of attempted murder later on. I mean, it's bad. Okay? Tragic. And it's over a long stretch of a lot of painful years, but it doesn't, it doesn't end well for Saul. And part of that is because evil had poured into his life and poisoned him like sewage. Right? He was poisoned in his soul. And nobody else could see it. Right? It was all inside of Saul. But we're going to look at three scenes as we go through this. One is, we just talked about the victory at Gilgal, but there was some arrogance there at Gilgal. We'll talk about that first. Then he had an obsession with winning. Right? He had to win. And then the third was, he had some insubordination around the decisions he made against Amalek. Okay? So, and the Amalekites. So we're, we're going to look at those three things. But those were the three things that really caused him to go down the back side of that roof line. Now, his first misstep occurs here in chapter 13 of 1 Samuel. And we just read in verse 1, 2, and 3 about, and, and 4, and where you know, they had the army. Right? Saul so picked the fight with the Philistines. Nothing wrong with that. Right? They were enemies of the Israelites. You know, that's what he's supposed to do as king. Because they were living on land that was promised to Israel by God. Right? So part of the king's job was to get rid of those guys. But they were not peaceful neighbors at all. Right? They were they were hateful to Israel for generations. <clears throat> and, and and Saul provokes the Philistines and then he urges the Israelites to go to war and and he summons all of them to meet in Gilgal. Why don't you flip back just for a second to chapter 10, a couple pages over, in verse 8. <coughs> My fingers don't want to work this morning. There we go. This is Samuel giving instruction to Saul on what he's supposed to do. He says, And thou shalt go down before me to Gilgal, and behold, I will come down to, unto thee to offer burnt offerings, and to sacrifice sacrifices of peace offerings. Seven days shalt thou tarry till I come unto thee, and show thee what thou shalt do. So those were his instructions in, in, ver, in chapter 10. Um, And that's, and Saul is doing exactly what the people hoped he would do, right? Lead them into battle, defeat their enemies, secure the land for Israel. I mean, that's what they wanted the king for. Kind of like Joshua, right? But, but that was kind of the test for Saul. Would would Saul follow in Joshua's footsteps, or would Saul do things Saul's way? Because if you remember with Jericho, did did Joshua do anything spectacular other than listen to God's plan? I mean, if 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 Joshua had tried to follow an earthly war plan, they would have never beat Jericho. They would have turned tail and walked back across the Jordan River. They wouldn't have even done anything. Because it was impossible. They weren't enough people, they weren't armed well enough. Jericho was too well fortified. They've been wandering around for 40 years. They were tired. They were hungry. They were... Of themselves, they could never defeat Jericho. Ever. But Joshua didn't work on earthly terms. Right? He followed God's plan, and God said, well, march around and shout. What's that going to do? I mean, if you're an earthly general, you're like... Pfft. What's that going to do? Right? But Joshua had faith. That's what he was instructed to do. And he took the Lord into battle. So the question is, would Saul do that? Would he take the Lord and follow the Lord into battle the way that Joshua had done? 
Or would he take matters into his own hands? Where the Lord is more of a sidekick. Right? Or, or a helper. But he's waiting. Saul is waiting at Gilgal or Mishmash for the or Gilgal for the truth to arrive. In verse 5 of chapter 13, it says, And the Philistines gathered themselves together to fight with Israel, 30,000 chariots, 6,000 horsemen, and people as the sand which is on the seashore in multitude. And they came up and pitched, pitched in Mishmash eastward from Beth Haven. So, 30,000 chariots. Israel had 3,000 people in their army. The Philistines had 10 times the number of chariots than Israel had fighters. They could have had a million people, hundreds of thousands of warriors that are seasoned in battle and experienced in war. And they're coming up against the Israelites. Saul's army of 3,000, only 2,000 of which are there, right? The other 1,000 were with Jonathan in Geba. In verse 6, when the men of Israel saw that they were in a strait, for the people were distressed, then the people did hide themselves in caves and in thickets and in rocks and in high places and in pits. That sounds like an army. They run around hiding under rocks, digging holes. Box, box holes. Box holes, right? <laughs> but they weren't for fighting, they were for hiding. <laughs> While they're waiting for the troops to arrive and waiting for Samuel to come back and offer the, the offerings so that the Lord would fight the battle for them, the longer they're waiting, the bigger the Philistine army is getting. The Philistine army also had a, a lot of like iron weapons. The, the Israelites had like brass weapons. And then the Philistine weapons would just shred anything that they had. I mean, they had brass shields and an iron sword to just clash through a brass shield. Yes, sir? You've got to wonder, did the, did the armies that fought against Israel, do you think that they, the, people, the men sent the, I guess their general sent them to fight the Israelites, did they know that they were going to lose? Or did they, like, they knew that they were defeated everybody else? Well, and they, they didn't, they weren't really an army. They were just, all the people just sort of milling around. Oh, okay. Right? And so, <clears throat> but in those areas, the Lord would just smite the other That's people. That's what he's saying. Is, I'm saying they, know, they know that. They were going to be That's defeated. The Lord, I mean, they, right. If the Lord was in it, he'd yeah. just take care of it. Yeah. Right? Many how, didn't matter how many of them were thrown yeah. against. No. Well, and one of the judges, Gideon, right, he had a bunch of resources available, right. and God told him to just send 300 wow. against tens of thousands of people, and that the Lord would make him a victory, and he did. Right? right? The, the Lord can win a battle with against immeasurable bad odds. Well, he's still going to do it this day. And he is. He but, but as he went on, and as they're sitting around in Gilgal, the prospects are getting bleak. They're, they're sending more Philistines. Samuel's still not here. What are we going to do? Why isn't the king doing something? Just waiting around for days. What are we doing? And I think Saul was probably nervous about it too. He was probably looking. Well, he probably didn't have watches back then. But you know, where's where's Samuel? Checking his sundial. Right? Where's Samuel? And the chariots that the Philistines had were like the modern day equivalent of a of a tank. So thirty thousand tanks against a bunch of people with no tanks. Right? That's not a good fair fight. Right? They had superior numbers, they had better weapons, they had better transportation, they were seasoned warriors, were warriors, they were veterans of combat. And the Israelites had none of that, and were none of that. None of those things. 
And so no surprise, Saul's army is suffering a lot of desertion. High rate of desertion. People are hiding in any place. They're crossing back across Jordan River to get out of there. And every day, more and more people are leaving. So the Bible doesn't say how many, but i got to think, people are scattering. They don't have confidence. And those that did stay were not real. It says in verse 7, And some of the Hebrews went over Jordan to the land of Gad and Gilead. As for Saul, he was yet in Gilgal, and all the people followed him, trembling. Trembling. They were scared. They, were scared. they didn't know what was going to happen. And Saul's waiting around for Samuel, waiting around, and all the while he's watching his big powerful army just fade away. They're running, they're hiding. But he was to wait seven days by Samuel's instructions. Back in chapter 10. And then Samuel was going to come. And he was going to offer the sacrifices. And then he was going to deliver the battle plan of God to Saul. You know, when I come back, I'm going to do these sacrifices. And I'll tell you what God says you should do. Right? Whether that's marching around the city with your trumpets or whatever it is, the same way I did with Jericho. You know, I'll give you God's plan, but don't do anything until I get there. So, five days, more people are leaving. Six days, Philistines are sending in more reinforcements and bigger troops and more chariots. Day seven, there's probably mutterings of mutiny in the nation of Israel. Who is this guy? I mean, I know Samuel said he was our king, but he's not doing anything. Just sitting around. You gotta do something. But how are we supposed to do something against this mob? <laughs> we get ourselves killed. Some king. And you gotta think, that's some of the comments or commentary that had to be going on in Israel. And Samuel still had not arrived. If they waited any longer, the Hebrew army would be so depleted, there would be such a ragtag group of trembling, fearful soldiers, they wouldn't be any good. There's no way. So Saul, Saul felt like he had to do something, anything. And so he kind of takes matters into his own hands. Look at verse 8 in chapter 13. And, and he tarried seven days according to the time set that Samuel had appointed. But Samuel came not to Gilgal, and the people were scattered from him. And Saul said, Bring hither a burnt offering to me, and peace offerings. And he offered the burnt offering. Now, Saul's actions, there were three major errors with this. Number one, kings were not supposed to offer sacrifices on behalf of the people or the community. They could offer sacrifices for their own sins, but they couldn't do it on behalf of the people. That was the job of the priest. The second thing was, Samuel was supposed to convey God's battle plan to the people. And Saul was directed to wait for him so that he could do that. But Saul kept looking at the time go by and his ever shrinking army and he said I gotta do something so he does the sacrifice and what that did what you gotta understand is and we talked about why the people wanted a king they wanted a king because all the other nations around them had kings right earthly kings we want to be like them we don't want to be different we want to be just like everybody around us. Sound familiar? So, but the problem was those nations around them were all pagan nations. And their kings had their rituals and their things. So their kings would offer sacrifices when they would go into battle, but it was a bribe. It was a bribe to their pagan gods for them to gain a victory. And so by Saul doing exactly what the earthly kings did, 
it turned the whole offering and peace offering unto God into more of a pagan ritual than a real offering unto God. It was, it was less of a bribe. I mean, it was turned into a bribe rather than seeking God's wisdom about what they should do. Do you think Saul did not know how to pray? He wasn't instructed by Samuel very much. But, I mean, but he did prophesy with the prophets. So yeah. he, he had the knew, Spirit of God in David him. knew how to pray. You know what I mean? David right. made mistakes as a king. But David knew how to pray. David knew how to have faith in God. It seemed like Saul had no um, spiritual side. Right. He trusted in his I own mean, he, he prophesied when it came all over him to do that. But there wasn't any uh, faith in God with him. You know, when, even when he went and hid himself in the stuff, right. he, he wasn't having any faith in God about, wow, God, you've chosen me. I must be going to be able to do this. I mean, you know, if you've chosen me. Right. And, and then goes out and hides in the stuff. And, then and that was really the first indicator that he didn't have the relationship with God. He didn't have a relationship God. with the Lord because here he did, it doesn't say he went to the Lord and said, what should I do? Samuel's not here. Is he going to come? You know, will you help him to come? <laughs> and, and Samuel's sacrifice was going to be more an act of submission than an act of bribery. Right? But Saul decided to trust himself at the crisis point. I mean, they were reaching a crisis point. Right? They were, they were facing an enemy that was far superior to them. But his decision to sacrifice and then attack was based on his earthly experience and the things that he saw the other kings doing. Right? I'm going to model myself after the world, my world that I see. So that's one of the things we don't want to do, right? So we want to model ourselves after what God is instructing us to do. God instructed Samuel to tell Saul to wait for him so that Samuel could do the right things. And Saul didn't wait. Now what Saul was doing to Saul and to all the earthly people around him made perfect sense. Right? Because that's what everybody else was doing. But just like Israel's desire to have a human king and their acceptance of Saul based on his tall stature and strength and outward appearance. Saul was ready to advance on the enemy with his own strategy, not with God's plan. Do you think that he thought if he sacrificed to God that God would help him without Samuel? Yes, and he didn't know what else to do. Because Samuel told him the sacrifice was necessary, right? Because he said, I would do it. But by Saul taking it in his own hands, Saul left the fate of Israel up to earthly rules, not God's kingdom rules. And, and Saul may have had a really good plan. I mean, he probably had generals who were going to figure out the points where they needed to attack and da da da. But it wasn't God's plan. It was Saul's plan. And again, remember Jericho. Who would have anticipated the way... I don't even know that Joshua knew <laughs> how God was going to defeat Jericho. He was like, oh, he just told me to do this, and blow these trumpets and shout and see what happens. Nobody would have thought that the walls would lay flat. Nobody. He didn't know, but he trusted God. Right. Completely. But if, but if Joshua had decided to do it his own way, it would have come out all different. Right? The whole thing would have been... Honestly, like I said earlier, Jericho, they should have just retreated. We can't, we can't do this. we got to get out of here before they kill us all. But he followed God's plan and he was rewarded because he followed God's plan. We serve a God 
that has limitless power and authority. We forget that sometimes. It doesn't matter if they have 30,000 chariots and umpty 6,000 soldiers and weapons of iron. It doesn't matter. With God's plan, it doesn't matter. Because he has limitless power and authority. And, and, and creativity is God's trademark. I mean, just read the, think of the stories in the Bible that you know and just sit there for a minute and just think amazed at how unusual God's plans are. The Red Sea. Who'd have thunk it? That just, and the waters are just, and we just walk. Nobody thought that was going to happen. I don't even think Moses thought it was going to happen. He just said, hold your stick up. <laughs> Watch what I'm going to do. Um, later on, uh, Korah uh, rebels against Moses and tries to take the people. God says, you know what? I'm going to do a new thing. If they die the death of normal people, then Moses isn't my man. But if they die a new, different way, then what happened? Immediately, when he said it, the earth opened up and swallowed the whole 250 of them whole and burned the rest of them with fire and brimstone. Like that had never happened before. That had never happened before. It was different. Well, look at the faith that Rahab the harlot had. When she hung right? that cord out the window. All the walls fall flat except for her house. The fiery furnace. Those boys weren't supposed to come out whole, unsinged, no smoke on their clothing. The lion's den. Are you kidding me? We have a very creative God, and that's his trademark. He does things in such an unusual fashion that you cannot deny that he is the one doing it. Because there's no way you and I could have ever figured that out or done that. So when Saul got under pressure, if he had some faith that God was going to help him, if he had enough faith to, to just say, now I'm going to do what the Lord said, I don't know how it's going to turn out, but I'm going to wait on him and believe in him. Right. You know? But he didn't. He didn't have faith. Did Noah have faith? It never rained on the earth. Ever. Yeah. And he used to build this ginormous ark. Laughed out. He was scorned by his neighbors. He was right. hundreds of years in building the ark. No, a hundred years. A hundred years? Yes. Still. <laughs> still. Right. Just a hundred years. Sorry. <laughs> Still, and what did he do? He makes it rain so much that there's no land anywhere for 150 days. Did that ever happen before? Thank the Lord it never will happen again, right? We got the rainbow and the cloud for that. But a worldwide flood? That's creative, folks. That's thinking out of the box. That's acting with... <laughs> that's, that's acting with unlimited power, limitless power and authority. Right? Now, you think that the God that did all those things can't solve whatever your biggest challenge is? We better not think that or we'll be like Saul, won't we? Exactly. We'll be down the roof line. Should we rely on our own resources when God gives us access to his great limitless power and authority? says, lean not into thine own understanding. But in all thy ways, Always. all thy ways, right? Acknowledge him, Acknowledge Acknowledge him and he him. shall direct thy path. And he can get it done in a miraculous way. You and I are just going to get it done the old-fashioned way. Boring, right? I want to see God do a new thing. I mean, I don't want to see a worldwide flood. Let me get that out of the way. But, but if I have to get things done in my own abilities, in my own strength, in my own ingenuity, boring. Probably not getting it done either. And, and, and invariably, I'll rush ahead into it and do try to do it my own way. Moses did that, right? When he killed the Egyptian, he, he was trying to set something ahead and 
It wasn't God's time for that. But we rush ahead, and when we do that, we don't receive that miracle, that, that imaginative miracle that He's got in store for us. I mean, years ago, He could have healed my back any way He wanted to, but He chose to do it in a way that was miraculous, that I could not deny. I could not refute or say I had anything to do with me or anyone else on this earth. And it made, it made a believer of me for 19 years now. God longs to give us more than we desire. Think of, think of the, the top of the pile of stuff that you desire, and God's going to give you way over that. That's exciting. We should be anticipating that. But what we do is we limit him by preempting his plans with our own hasty, clumsy solutions. If we just... Don't frown upon a sober. No, no, I'm not <laughs> frowning upon anybody. I'm just trying to make a point. I know. But Saul's faith failed. He saw his new army, and they're all running across the Jordan River to Gad and, and, and his folks. And they're evaporating. The whole town of Mishmash overflowing with enemy troops. More coming in all the time. Bigger, bigger chariots. And then he saw the appointed seven days pass, and still no Samuel. So he tossed aside what he knew was the right thing to do. Because up until this point, I mean, he could have burnt the offering on day five, right? If he really wanted to just bail, he could have done it earlier. But he did try. But it just didn't work. He didn't wait long enough. I'll tell you something, too. The only person that he had to do to encourage him in that way, I think, was Samuel. And, Samuel. and Samuel's gone and missing. he wasn't there. Right. And maybe but that was the if test. Saul was somebody to listen to somebody else, he could have. Right. Maybe Jonathan was such a good good man, he could have listened to Jonathan, but he didn't listen to Jonathan. He was just a boy at this point. Yeah. yeah. Nobody he listens didn't have to that. Nobody, no parent listens to their kids for advice. No. Well. <laughs> <laughs> that was good timing. Can I? Uh, I quit. Yeah. <laughs> Good but he he hadn't appeared and you're right Samuel would have fortified Saul to where he would have had the faith that we would have got but that was the test right you gotta wait until I tell you you gotta do what I tell you you gotta be obedient unto the things that the Lord is telling me to tell you to do and Samuel I'm sorry Saul tossed that aside he tossed aside what he knew was the right thing to do he put on his royal apparel and he attempted to make the altar the instrument of his power and authority. Something he had no right to do. He was not in authority to do that. Now when a person is living on the, the downslope of their life, and then they're filled with sort of a pride in it, hey, I'm the king, I can do this. I'll put on the royal crown and the royal apparel, and I'll just... I know how to burn stuff. <laughs> Roles and responsibilities get blurred. The responsibilities get meaningless. The person assumes command of everything and everyone around them, even going so far as to appear noble and righteous. Look at verse, uh, we'll stop after this, chapter ten, uh, 13, verse 10. And it came to pass that as soon as he had made an end of offering and burnt offering, behold, Samuel came. Now Samuel shows up. And Saul went out to meet him, that he might salute him. And Samuel said, What hast thou done? And Saul said, Because I saw that the people were scattered from me, and thou camest not within the days appointed, 
that the Philistines gathered to get themselves together at Mishmash. Therefore said I, right? It's all about me. The Philistines will come down now upon me to Gilgal, and I have not made supplication unto the Lord. I forced myself, therefore, and offered a burnt offering. So listen to the mixture of the, the rationalization that goes on with him. Well, you know, if you've been here on time, Samuel, you were supposed to be here earlier. Or <laughs> blame shifting or mischaracterization. I mean, Saul's got a bunch of psychological things going on here. And it was like he said, I mean, I just couldn't help myself. It, I looked down and my hands were just doing it. Remember when Aaron made the golden calf? He says, well, I just put all this stuff in and this golden calf came out. <laughs> what? I sound like a kid. Excuse. Exactly. And Aaron was the older. Right. right? It's like, wait a minute. It just happened. It just kind of happened. I don't know. I just, I didn't mean justification, rationalization, right? These are all traits within Saul that are coming out now. But not repentance. No, it was not repentance. He blamed Samuel. If you if you'd come when you said, I wouldn't have been having to do all this, right? We ready now or if, in a, if you are, but if not, let me repeat where I gotta go. Couple couple more minutes if that's all right. It's all right. Um I mean, I looked down and my hands were kind of doing it. I mean, it just kind of happened. In fact, I had to make myself do it. You were late. The enemy's getting bigger. The people are getting more nervous. The army's getting smaller. Where were you? Time ran out. So this is really your fault, Samuel. That's what he's saying. But he was wrong. It wasn't about Samuel. This was deliberate disobedience based on the belief that something was true. It was a presumption. And it was arrogance on the part of Saul. And Samuel calls him on it. Look at verse 13. And Samuel said to Saul, Thou hast done foolishly. Thou hast not kept the commandment of the Lord thy God, which he commanded thee. For now would the Lord have established thy kingdom upon Israel forever. But, Brother Don, aren't we glad that Saul did that? Right. Because we needed David. <laughs> Well, and Saul doesn't realize that yet, and I don't think he ever does. But this confrontation, I mean, Saul, Samuel's telling him the way it is. Right? So we come back next week where we talk about that. Um, actually, we need to work that out because I will not be here next Sunday. Um, I mean, I may be able to. I, I got to see what my schedule is, so we'll see. But either way, this confrontation, it, it's seldom pleasant when somebody calls you on the carpet, right? So, the same as like, you've done foolishly. And he's telling the king this. Okay? And the king's in charge of everything and everybody. Right? So, but we're talking about that. What happens when that happens? And then we're going to look at another surprise. Alright, we're going to read it. We're good, we're finishing up. All right, so we will come back next week and do that. Thank you.
finished, asked Brother Don if he might have finished up just a little early, so we were going to have a couple things we talk about on Pastor Appreciation Day, and that are really clean, this. It is really clean. <laughs> Sorry. Um, it's just got the cleanest stuff on it. Maybe it was Brother Don. Yeah, or it's a, the anointing oil that, okay, well, it's it's off now. Um, anyway, I just thank the Lord that we're able to be here, like I said, and um, thank you. So um, we're going to, I think that part of appreciating somebody is not having to say it later, but to say it when it's time and when someone's here to hear it. And sometimes um, we, we put off saying some things we could say because we think we have endless amounts of time. And when we realize that that time may have ended with someone, we should have said, I wish I would have said that to them. I wish I would have told them how I felt. I wish that there would have been something that I would have shown them that they would have known really how my heart was. And so I thought today what we would do, if everybody will come on in, all the children will come in and sit down. Everybody will just come on in. Come on in and sit down. I know it's, we're, I'm doing it different today. Changed it up a little bit. Everybody come on in. Come sit down, please. Thank you. Sister Netta, Brother Jose, when y'all are ready. So when, um, when we have the time, what does it say? It's like make hay while it's day. <laughs> while the sun shines, make some hay. So today we're going to make some hay for Sister Linda. Sister Linda, will you come up here and sit? Because I know that people are wondering where you are because you haven't been shown, shown, I guess. Let's move. We'll move a little chair, I guess. Or do, you know what? It's all right. Just sit right here by these flowers. It'll be okay. That way, this is a little awkward. We, I mean, that's the truth. It gets awkward when you say your feelings. It gets awkward when you're standing here listening to them. It's just the truth. It, our, our lives, but the, if we have something to say, if we have flowers, let's give them today. And that's what some of you put it in cards. Some of you put it, um, you know, have other ways you're going to share that and show it. But if there is something that you would like to say, I'm going to give some time before we go into our regular service just to share that. Now, if it's dead silence, I'm telling y'all it's going to be awkward and it's going to be me saying everything my mother is to me. So I'm asking that it, uh, when it, you can get in trouble when you open mic so because everybody gets shy. But please be willing to just share. If there's anything that Sister Linda's done or said that's meant something to you, please be willing to share it with us today. We won't put you on the camera. You just can stand or sit and... Just um, whatever you'd like to say and share. I'm opening it up. Thank you, Brother David. I appreciate Sister Linda. Um, of all the years, and even when Brother Michael was around, they never failed to pray for me, keep me in their prayers, and keep me in their thoughts, and they for a while for my family. And I really appreciate it. And I love them. And I wish I could have told Brother Michael that. But I do appreciate you. I love you. Somebody else. <laughs> Sorry, brother. It's all right, fire. I'd rather that. <laughs> I'd like to say I appreciate Sister Wanda greatly. She's been a rock to me. She's always there. No matter what, she may be going through her own problems, her own bout of grief, or whatever the case may be but she's there for her people and she's always been there for me and I appreciate it and I love you. Amen. Somebody else? I just want to say I appreciate you, Sister Linda. <coughs> Miss Brother Michael dearly. But if it wasn't for y'all, I wouldn't be where I'm at now. And uh, you're just, you're a blessing to all of us in this church. And I love our church. I love you. Granny, if you'd passed away before I was born, <laughs> I wouldn't even be here. Right. It's true. That's true. true. <laughs> you would help me. <laughs> okay. Thank you, baby. 
seeing her do it with a bunch of other people outside where we are, the nursing homes, the other ministries that she does, just the people she interacts with every day, not just at service times, but all day, every day, willing to put herself out there, put Christ in front of people. And that's been a role model for me to try to achieve. I just appreciate you very much. <laughs> um, Sean, you've often talked about your pastor's wife when you grew up and how much she means to you and how you still think about things that she told you and words that she said that's the way I look at you to me you've always been that pastor's wife the one that when you need a godly woman in your life I look to my mom but I look to you too because I know if I never need any advice, any prayer, you're there. And I love you so very much. I know that I don't know. I hear about all the things you go through and the struggles you have with all the grief you've been through. And thank God I haven't lost anybody super close to me. So I don't know what you're going through, what Sister Lee goes through. But you hold it together for the church, for the people that you love. And I know with, with God's help, you do that. <coughs> And I, pr- I appreciate you so much for for doing that for us because I know sometimes it's a struggle. <laughs> well, she's Sister Linda to you, but she's my sister. <laughs> I love her so dear. I've known Linda my whole life. I've known her before she was saved after she was saved. And one thing I can say is she's always had a goal in the heart. And it got better when she let Jesus in. I guess that's always a love I just want to say I love you and thank you for being like a mom to me when I was younger and thank you for being a mom to me now when I'm older and I love your whole family and I love you and I appreciate you for everything you do for everybody and thank God we have you and thank God God chose you to do what you're doing for everybody because we all need it even mama would call you whenever she had a problem and say, I need you. And when I have a problem, I'm like, I need you. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, God chose you for our matriarch of this, whatever this is. So we appreciate you for everything. And when I do anyway, I appreciate you. And I love you with everything. I love you. Somebody <laughs> Hey, appreciate you, Granny. Uh, that uh, I just want to say that you know, out of all the things that you know we go through as a church, you know, just kind of like piggybacking off of what Sister Barbara said, is that uh, you can imagine your own battles that you go through as a Christian, a saved Christian. You know, when the, when you're saved and have Jesus in your heart, the devil all he wants to do is just battle you and just take ownership back of you like to get you back into the world <coughs> and just that one battle alone just seems like it's too much to bear but you can imagine a shepherd having to go through it for the flock and it's so great and I really appreciate that you are such a shield to us and just a rock to our church and I appreciate you very much somebody else I'm so blessed to have you as my pastor and my granny. And um, I, the impact that you've had 
on my entire life, I don't think I will ever, I don't think I'll ever be able to say how much you are one of the best examples in my life of what a godly woman should be like. And I appreciate that so much more than I can ever say. And throughout this past year and a half, you've displayed so much strength as things are changing and changing so vastly. No matter what has changed around us, you've adapted and you've overcome those struggles and you're still overcoming them with the strength of the Lord. And I really appreciate seeing that example of no matter what what may be thrown at me, no matter what has been thrown at you, you've trusted the Lord through it all. And he's bringing us through it day by day. And I really appreciate that. And I love you so, so very much. Somebody else? Sister Linda, I love you. <coughs> we have been friends for a long time. We've done things together. We've laughed together. We've cried together. And I appreciate the rock that you are. I've watched your life. I've watched your struggles. I've watched your joy. I've seen you in peace. I've seen you when you were distraught. But one thing I've seen is you've always been faithful to God no matter what. So if you can do it, I can do it. And I thank God for you being that example. I appreciate you very much. So much. I was thinking about it when I was shopping and I asked the Lord I said Lord you show me what to buy for my sister and I wanted something that would give you warmth let's get it sister which one is it it's the it's gold, yet gold one because you gave me a gift <coughs> and remember I said I felt like I'm sitting under a cloud <laughs> and every time I use that gift to surrender with you I think about you <laughs> oh well how blessed I was to give it to you oh my it does look like a cloud <laughs> wow, wow. wow. it is a cloud <laughs> wow. I feel like I could use it right now <laughs> <laughs> Oh my, that's beautiful. Thank you. It looks like a cloud. Sister Barbara took me shopping. I walked in the store, walked right back there to it, and <coughs> laid my hand on it. It was right there. It's a pretty view of the cloud, you know. So. <laughs> oh, <yeah. laughs> oh, I think I did that. <laughs> there might be more. I've got okay. Somebody else. While I'm struggling a little. <laughs> well, I will. Um, I've only known you since June 19th of last year. Is that right? Yeah. When I came down here, and I had never been around anyone like you or your family. Never known anybody like that. And what I found was that you were the first person and lead that um, ever cared about my soul. I never had anybody I realized do that. And when I walked in the store that night, and you and Lee were sitting here, and you hugged my neck, and um, then I started watching how y'all lived, and I thought, that's all, that's all, that's something that's great. I want to do that. Oh, hallelujah. <laughs> oh, glory to God. I just want to thank you for that. <laughs> Oh, that's so beautiful. Tammy, you just wrapped me in something just then. Hope. Hope. Hope for others. Tammy, you've wrapped us in that ever since you've been here. Go ahead, Yvonne. <laughs> Sister Yvonne. It's been a long year. It's ending very well. 
with this church and this family that we have now and our salvation. And you have an understanding of what I feel every day. And you give me compassion just by looking in my eyes sometimes. I know you can tell. And you just are so much help. But Too, but go ahead. Well, I've been I've been sitting and trying to think of a way to say this in a way that sounds good. <laughs> um, <laughs> but it's not it's not bad. Okay. I just I just I want to thank I want to thank the Lord for letting Granny help us with our ministry um, because and this is <laughs> because I don't think we would be at the level we are at and the level of people we would be able to reach without her being there and able to sing because we've done our music and mom has done her music and it, it has gone places but it hasn't you know as far as as where compared to this it hasn't really gone anywhere and then when granny stepped in that's when it really started to, people started to see this is what sanctification looks like this is what holiness looks like and and people started wanting that and wanting to you know see what our services are like because of that and the other thing is, is that Granny has been a constant as far as she has not really changed that much as far as our number of people who have seen our services has changed a lot in the past year and a half. But as far as the overall service and what happens in it and how it affects us, that hasn't changed at all. If you would see a service before this, I think the only thing that's changed is we have more lighting and better sound equipment. And, and I thank the Lord for that that we are able to keep bringing people what we have and not have to, well, I guess we have to televise it up or, you know, we have to make it look better for Facebook. We just do what we do and act like there's not a camera there in a lot of ways because we're just having church. And if people want to see our church, then they do. And they're going to. And I thank the Lord for blessing us with that. And I thank the Lord for not only what Sister Linda has done as a pastor, but as a granny for me as we live together. I thank her for that. There's too much to get into and take too long, but I, I thank the Lord for her that we're able to honor her today, and it's also her birthday. So happy birthday, Granny! Yeah. Somebody else, y'all want to talk to her? Go ahead, here you go. I love Granny. Aww. I love Granny. You love Aww. Granny too. Somebody else. One of my little boys that I read to. The Bible down at the playground. His father's here today, Jeremiah. The first day he's come. And well, you've been here a long time ago, but the first day he's come. It's different today, but next week we'll be back in regular Sunday school. But I'm so glad you came, Jeremiah. He made you a card, too. I know. So you can it. see it. I it. it. Anybody else? You can. You can get her your cards. She'll, she'll, she's going to read cards maybe later. But. This is good. This is good. <laughs> sarcasm. Yeah. Oh. Happy birth appreciation. Wow, that was the best mashup I could do. The church. <laughs> Somebody else. <laughs> it's you, babe. Um, I say I love you, Granny. I appreciate everything you've done. That you are doing. Um, Come here, honey. This is with me and Cap on. Let's just pray for Sister Ned and Sister Linda right now. But the Lord, Lord, we just thank you for help for all of us. We ask you, God, to wrap them in your arms and help them and strengthen them. You know, we all handle grief differently. And today is a wonderful day, but full of memories for a lot of us. And it's very different. So I ask you, Lord, to just wrap your love around all of us. I pray that you'll strengthen Netta. 
and help her strengthen us. Strengthen Sister Linda. Thank you for your strength. We can count on you for all of your hope and your help that you have. Thank you for what you did for Tammy bringing her here. Thank you for what you did for David and <laughs> God. Thank you, Lord, for saving Sister Barbara. Thank you, Lord, for saving God. Thank you, God, for saving Jose. Make it helping him want to be here. Helping him want to be grow up and have his babies grow up in this church. Thank you for Sister and Brother Henson that have been so faithful. Strength to Mama and Daddy. Thank you for Brother Henson wanting to do this today. Thank you for Sister Annie that's been with us from the very beginning, even when I wasn't. Thank you for my Netta that came to us. Bill and Lady and Laura, you gave to us. Oh, me and Nehemiah that you gave to us. My dear Uncle Billy that has been so real to present when Mama needs him. <laughs> Sweet Stacy and Tammy who reach out to Mama and let him be better. Comfort him and he comfort her. Thank you, Lord, for all that you are. Thank you, Lord, for what you're doing in our church. Thank you, Lord, for the salvation you're working through this church to help others that are far away, that you are drawing them to you. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. My contact's going to fly, y'all. <laughs> All right. Anybody else? Sister Linda, mind saving for my message. Is that okay? Uh, I mean, I've got a lot to say, but that's why I started early, because if I say too much, we won't get to eat our warm food that we can smell in there. It smells so good. we got to pick up the chicken at 12.15 in the ice. Anybody else? Sister Linda, go ahead. I could tell the Lord this morning I did. I said, you've kept me good for 73 years. And I was thinking back on all the, you know, when we were kids, Billy. You know, he kept me good, didn't he? Kept us all good. Yeah. And, uh, and through all of, when Brother Michael was lost, he kept me good. When Brother Michael was saved and we pastored this church, he's kept me good. He's kept me good after Brother Michael died. He's kept me good. And I, all I could tell him was, Lord, you've kept me good all these 73 years. Oh. And I appreciate him so much. I mean, oh, glory to your wonderful holy name. <coughs> glory to your goodness. Glory to your grace. Thank you, Lord. Glory to your mercy. Thank glory you. to your kindness. Glory to your love. Glory to your love. Amen. Oh, a vessel of my kindness. I'm showing to you. That you might also know that I will be kind to you. I will hold out my ways to you and give you that opportunity to live for me, even as I have given this vessel of my kindness. Only be faithful and listen to me. Learn from my words and do that that I'm pleased with, and you will see the kindness that I desire to show you every day of your life. The best of my kindness. Thank you. Thank you. Oh. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Oh, glory to God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Holy Ghost. Thank you, Holy Ghost. 
Praise God. Oh, well, I'm really going to change it up. We'll sing at the end if that's okay because what the Lord just said was I, I don't know that I have a whole lot of sermon because the Lord just said what He said and that was what um, He gave me this morning early. He gave me something about something that we were talking about on the plane. It was three letters, TLC. And TLC stands for tender, loving care. It's not used as much anymore except about houses. They say, well, you know, that house needs some TLC, and so we can't sell it right away. Or it's, you know, it was used as a band name, or it was used as, a, I think, a station now, a channel. But um, it still means tender, loving care, kindness love, attention given to a person in order to lift their spirits, promote recovery from accident, illness, depression, sadness, TLC. And one way that the Lord in His Word shares about tender, loving care and how I want to encourage us today is through the vessel of kindness some of that that I want to share about that vessel that is shown kindness to many through the years. But in that, just like what the Holy Ghost said, if I wondered if this morning he had given me this, he really showed me he has, is that we need to put action to tender love and care. We need to have it as a verb. It needs to be instead of a descriptive word. Oh, they need some TLC. Sister Yvonne, when you're driving, you may need some TLC because you want to talk to people because that's what you had that, a relationship with that's not able to be there right now. So you need that TLC. Well, in order for it to be a verb, I need to be tender to you. I need to give you love and I need to act with care. And that's what the Lord has shown Sister Linda to do. And through her example and through others' examples, we've learned to be able to give TLC, to be able to be tender to others. Sometimes, though, life gets so busy and we really get to where we feel like everybody's okay. You know, they're doing all right. It's okay. I mean, they're, they're sad here and there, but they're tough. They're strong. They'll make it. Or the other thing that may happen sometimes when we think about TLC is, well, I really need it. You don't mean to be selfish, but you begin thinking of all the ways that wouldn't it be nice when my honey gets home from Texas. I'm going to need some TLC because I've been without her for several days. I'm, re I'm ready to see her. I'm ready to be with her and her tell me how much she cares for me. But so sometimes we, we don't see the other person's need because we're needy. It's not intentionally selfish. It's not hurtful. It's not meant to be that way many times. I don't think anyone in this room would look and see one of us in need and say, you know, I'm just not going to give care. You wouldn't. But many times, Don will be running around because he's so capable. And I realize, do you need me to run that to FedEx? Because he's just rushing. He's like, do you have time? Because usually I don't. <laughs> but, I, you know, something like that, just to be aware that somebody needs a little extra a little something more than that, that's normal, maybe. That there's some help that you can give. In 2 Timothy 2 and 24, I'm going to find it in this little Bible, I guess, but I like using my daddy's. And I think it's over there, but I just got going. So 2 Timothy 2 and 24. Paul is talking to Timothy as a son. And um, he's telling him how to be a good man of God. 
or good person of God. And the servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all men, apt to teach, patient, in meekness instructing those that oppose themselves, if God peradventure will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth, and that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil, who are taken captive by him at his will. The night... I think it was the 18th, we said the 19th, but the night of June 18th when Tammy Wiley walked in here, she walked up to my mama and she hugged her and all of a sudden I knew she'd come home. I didn't know how it was going to work out. I didn't know what, I didn't know she knew it, but I knew that she had come home. And that gentleness, that tenderness that mama has, that Sister Linda has, that your granny has, that is a drawing force. What Bill was saying made a lot of sense. When I talk about, I have cards that I'll give up about ministry if I'm somewhere, and if they don't treat it like it's a bug, <laughs> I'm going to give them a card. If they want to accept it, you know, they're kind of open to it. I say, you know, we were... And I give kind of, it's a little spiel, but I don't mean it as a sales pitch, but it's just, it's what happened. I had a friend who had cancer and we began, it was my kid's band teacher. And we said, we can't come see you because COVID's going on. And so we'll sing you a song a day. And my aunt Virginia asked if we would put it on Facebook and social media because people needed to see it and be encouraged. And then when my daddy passed away, my mama began singing, singing with us and she's granny. And the whole world fell in love with Granny. And the reason that is, is the truth is sometimes, Mama, let's just be honest, we're really not that lovable. We're not always that tender. We're not always that loving. We're not always full of care. But that golden heart that the Lord gives someone to love people, people are aware of it. And you can give that. And she's taught us how to have that golden ability to look at somebody and say, you need to be loved. I have, the way I was raised, I'm very blessed. I've never not known being loved. But there are so many people who've never even known they were worth being loved. Sister Barbara, you've never felt it. We had a girl reach out to us a while back when we first started this ministry and she said, I don't feel loved at all. I don't even know that I deserve it. And I told Lady that because she was a young woman. I asked if I could share it. And Lady, who doesn't cry, if you don't mind me sharing this, teared up and said, I've never felt that. You've always made me feel love. If that's what the Lord put in Sister Linda, that TLC that everyone she comes in contact with can feel that love. That it fills empty tanks. Isn't that what we want? Where somebody walks up to us and if they're empty and don't believe they're worth anything, that the love that we have of Jesus Christ who rescued us, that is going to absolutely reach out and grab somebody who needs it. And wrap around and hug them. So be tender. Be gentle and tender. Then we're going to give love. Beloved, let us love one another. For love is of God. And everyone that loveth is born of God and knoweth God. If you're going to show love to somebody. And they're not easy to love. And I know everybody in this room is so easy to love. I see y'all. It's easy. 30 years ago, met at the mom, picked her up. I, know, I heard the story just a little bit today. Not a big one. But sometimes we're not easy to love. But if you're born of God and knows God, if you know God, somehow, even when you're struggling, you reach in and you try to pull up and love. And that's what I believe Sister Linda has been a wonderful example of. And acting with care. If we were to act with care, a perfect example of that is in Luke 8 and 14, and it's very familiar. It's the um, story of the Good Samaritan. And that, that man who was not a Jew 
reached out and saw someone who was beaten up and, and looked like they were dying. And that person uh, was on the side of the road and other people, religious people, had passed by because it was too much trouble. It was too hard. And I have to say I've had to do that sometimes. It's too hard. But this man, that Samaritan, the good Samaritan, in Luke 8 and 14, if I could get to it, and that's not it, so I'm going to tell the story. <laughs> that man, the good Samaritan, picked that man, poured oil and wine into his wounds, and put him on his donkey, and took care of him. A stranger. I've heard stories of people who their sibling would call them and say, listen, I have somebody that I know, and they're in the hospital in your town. Their family can't get there for a week. They're, they're flying there, but they're from, you know, they can't get there for a few days. Can you go and just check on them? Well, some of us would go and go to the hospital and say, hey, are you okay? You doing all right? You know, but people who have TLC, that person stayed at the hospital night and day until their family got there. Stacy, you got that. If you do. If, if you needed help, Stacy's called me. Do you need me to come down? Is there anything I can do? Can I come stay with your mama? What can I do? She'd uproot her entire life if she needed to. That's the type of TLC that the Lord puts in your heart to people. And that kind of giving is sacrificial. And that's where it gets hard sometimes. Because it's finding the balance between what is the, the, what the Lord wants me to give and where do I give out too much to where I don't have enough for me and where is what the Lord wants me to do there's a happy middle line and I have to say that daddy and I brother Michael and I always felt like mom erred on the side of way too much if there was a woman who wanted everything my mother had and asked her without shame she would and daddy had a, a teasing name for her but she would say finally mom said well honey would you ask for it? Do you want everything I have? And she said, yes, ma'am. Goodness. If she was honest. But there is a limit you have to get to where you find the boundary of how much you can give. But that would drive me and my daddy a little crazy because it's like, Listen, Mama, they're taking advantage of you. Listen, you're giving them too much of yourself. You're giving, but in the end, really, when she stands before the Lord, I think that giving too much is always better than not giving enough. Right. Holding and reserving stuff for yourself. In the end, if I give everything and I'm empty, won't the Lord Jesus Christ fill me up again? So some, a lot of times, Mama would have to stand toe-to-toe. -to -toe. I know it's hard for any of you to believe in this room that we had some disagreements. But sometimes, Mama and Daddy and I would stand toe-to-toe, -to -toe and Daddy and I are like, quit giving everything away. And now Dawn's like, can you, you're giving that away? Okay. <laughs> you're going to go get that person in the middle of the night and take them and bring them. What? Yeah. Because that's what we do. If you need, if you have it, give it. Why is the reason, though, what is the reason we can continue to be tender? Because, Sister Annie, I would almost guarantee everybody in this room has been tender and caring and loving, and you've done that, and you've thrown your heart down and said, Here, love, it's for you, and that person's gone. Stomp. Wait, Jesus is real. He's. He's loving. He loves you. And the love you feel for me is from Jesus. I don't want it. Thanks, though. Right? How do we keep going on? Because what my tendency is, and I'm going to confess my faults to my church and everybody that sees this later, is I instead I may turn the other cheek and I say I'm all right, but I also turn off a piece of my heart. Because if you're going to stomp on what I've got to give and, you know, and I'll tell you a story about that. We were in New York this week, and 
uh, Loria needed a few souvenirs for her class. And so we were at Niagara Falls and the souvenir shop was closed. So we went and we missed the parking lot and we pull up in this parking lot. There's nobody there. And so here we are, we're in this parking lot. And so we're sitting in the parking lot and I, and Lori and I are going to get out. It's cold. So Lori and I get out and Lori has gone into the store. And meanwhile, there's a man sweeping out in the parking lot and there's another man and he walks up and he has this jacket on. Well, in some places, when people are doing work like that, they're not always, they're usually hired by people, and maybe they're not city workers. They're actually people who are on the street that they're trying to help. Well, I assumed incorrectly about him, let me just say. I assumed that he was maybe not a worker, but he was being, just being helped. And so he said, it's $10 to park. And I said, is it? I don't see any signs. I'm sorry. So I had gone in. Lori was inside. We're in New York. So I'm walking. He's like, you can't go in there. It's $10. I'm like, well, it's $10 to park to get souvenirs. And meanwhile, there's something in me that rises up because I'm like, okay, are you even really supposed to be here and you're demanding $10 from me? So the, the love of Jesus and that balance of Lee Turner, this is what I'm going to say. Well, it, it, it changed. And so I went up to the Fred's register and I'm like, can he ask me for $10? Is he legitimately a parking aid? And they're like, we can't get involved. It's not our lot. And they're like, please don't ask. They don't want to be involved. Meanwhile, he's yelling, get out, get out of this store. You got, and I'm like, I'm like, what is the problem? I'm, I'm just asking if you're legitimate. And anyway, Don and Tammy, and my mother have been through those where I just have to, we've got to iron this out and we're going to iron it out and I get louder and he gets louder, but not angry. I'm just like, no, really, it's $10. Okay. I, I, I just want to get, see those postcards? And he's, get out, get out. He's yelling at me. I'm like, well, and then it comes. You know, you're going to be responsible to the Lord for this, for being mean to me because though Jesus loves you and he starts cussing about Jesus and he's angry. And meanwhile, my mother and Olivia are sitting in the car and Lori's gone back to the car now because I finally got her out of the store because she shopped all around and I'm trying to get her out while he's yelling at me and she's afraid. And so anyway, by the end of it, I'm like, well, why don't I just go give him the $10? So I go up back to him in the store and he's still very angry and yelling that I should be removed from the store. And I'm like, hey, buddy, I didn't know. We pulled in the wrong way, didn't see the signs. I'm so sorry. Here's $20. You could give the other 10 to the guy who's breaking leaves over there. <laughs> so it was fine. <laughs> he didn't laugh. He gave me a ticket. I never heard that part of the story. Well, I got it. <laughs> so... He gave me a ticket, and I'm like, no, no. He's like, let me give you your change. I'm like, no, no, it's okay, really. He can have it. You can split it. It's okay. I'm so sorry. I, I didn't realize it was parking. I'm trying to make it right now because Jesus finally rose up in me and my own self-righteousness about how, why I get have to pay $10 to sit in this parking lot? Meanwhile, so I'm trying to give him the, he's trying to give me the change back, and I'm like, it's all right. I'm so sorry. He's like, you know what? Here, give me the ticket back. I'm like, Okay, so give, give the ticket back. He gives me back money. He's like, just get your postcards and your stickers. I'm like, all right. So I'm like, you sure? He's like, yes. So anyways, I said, well, I'm sorry. You know, so anyway, we get that. I'm not sure where I was going, but I'm going to get back there. So we get that, and we get back, and I'm like, hey, you know when COVID started and the spiel begins? I just want to tell you about this ministry. I said, you've seen the worst of me, so you're going to know we're real. What we're saying. <laughs> I really didn't handle that right. You forgive me? I'm so sorry. He's like, yes, I go and get a card for him and the leaf sweeper. And they really were managing that parking lot. I don't know. But anyway, so I get in the car, and I realize that sometimes when you, you, you're just too feisty to really be tender. I mean, he was came up to me yelling, give me my $10. And I'm like, you look like you're homeless. And I'm sorry, I don't know that I'm supposed to give you that. And so, so meanwhile, I needed to pray through about it. And I went and apologized, and it's all okay. And I hope you're watching this morning. I don't know your name. Okay, so point is, is that sometimes we don't know how to be tender. Do we? 
that's my maybe my point. I'm not sure I was going somewhere else there, but sometimes we get our feelings hurt and we rise up. Sometimes we feel like we're being mistreated and it's time for me to stand up. We do need to stand up for some things. We don't need to be stomped on. I mean, Jesus was meek, not weak. He did go into the temple and throw the people out that were doing wrong things. I'm not saying let's all lie down and be um, uh, somebody who isn't standing up for right. But sometimes our tenderness gets so tired. We get so tired of people not caring about us showing love that we decide I'm just not going to give as much anymore. I'm not going to say I'm not. I'm not going to tell you, well, I just turned that off. I'm not going to say I don't care as much, but I'm just going to know in my heart you've scarred it and it's, I'm just not the same and I'm not going to give. So sometimes when it doesn't go the way we want, when we allow vulnerability, where being tough protects our own heart from pain, it's very difficult to do that and keep doing that in the name of love, in the name of the Lord. But the truth is, is that if love requires sacrifice or it's just care, if, I, if it doesn't take much for me to say, um, Mama, I love you, what do you need? You need me to do this today? Okay, I'm going to do that. And I run through those errands so I can hurry up and get my stuff done. And here, Mama, i got to go. I love you. And, and, and we've done that. It wasn't really a sacrifice for me to do that. It was just care. I was providing, I was meeting a need, or she was meeting my need. You need me to uh, fix Lori's hair before she goes to school? Yes, ma'am, do. That's care. It's great. Nothing wrong with it. But sometimes care gets so ingrained, we forget about love. We forget about tenderness, and we just care. And so, that's some care right there. But sometimes we don't know how to keep caring with tender love, and we allow the caring side to get off balance from the T and the L. The care is really up here. I'm meeting your needs, and that's what I'm doing. And because I'm meeting my, your needs, you better just like it. <laughs> and if you don't, well, I'm the one that's doing it. Bill and Lane, I'm the one that's doing it. I'm the mother that's having to do this for you. Then they get the martyr. I'm sorry, maybe I'm just preaching to me. The Bill and Lane have heard that, where I'm just caring, but the tender, loving part of me is kind of turned off because you've hurt my feelings or you didn't do it the way I thought you should or I didn't pray through enough about you because I don't know how to help you anymore. I don't know how to give of myself anymore. We just go through the motions and we don't realize that somebody really needs us to care with love and with tenderness. When we left, our lives have changed. I want to apologize, though, about something to my mother. When we left going to the airport, Mom teased and said, Now what are y'all going to do when we're gone? Because, you know, it's going to be boring for y'all or whatever. And we were just teasing. And all of a sudden she said, Well, I know the world really doesn't stop because a lot of my days are just spent by myself. She didn't mean it mean. She wasn't really guilting me. But I realized, you know, two years ago, I was at their house every day at least. Or I was, you know, I'd stop by and life and hurt and grief gets in the way. And you have to turn off some things just to be able to walk in that house sometimes. And so then I let care, who is strong on care? And then if she's handling it, well, I don't have to care that much. And I don't have to be tender and loving. I have failed in ways. I'm sure all of us could list ways that we, because we're hurt or because we're grieving or because we're scared or because we're tired, because we're sick, we've allowed going through the motions to become what used to be loving and cherishing and looking in someone's eyes and saying, what do you need me to help you with? How can I be what you need right now as a friend, as a sister, as a brother? 
We've gotten beyond that. In a marriage, I would, you know, there are times when Don and I are passing ships in the night and it goes on for weeks. And the other day when he's struggling to get that package and I realized, yeah, I don't have time to really do it, honestly. But it doesn't matter if I could just give a little TLC, it would maybe make his day easier. He does that constantly for me. Constantly he sees, can I do this for you? Yes. But I have allowed life to become care and not always TLC. But I can almost guarantee that that day I really tried to let him know, oh, I'll do it however you need it. Let me help you. But you, you always do that for me. But many times we become receivers and don't realize that we could give a little more and give with Jesus' love. I'm not getting on to any of us. Are any of us perfect? Are all of us all throwing our hearts down loving? Mama doesn't always say, Lee, I love you, I love you, I love you. She doesn't. So I'm not making her a saint of TLC either. I'm just saying that we all can be encouraged to be more like Jesus in caring for those. We can. We can. If things are unbalanced in your life, if you've realized, hey, I'm walking through some motions some days, I still got a little bit. Right. A lot. <laughs> Will? Okay. Maybe not. I guess we're done. <laughs> All right. So, I just, I can be there. So, I think part of this becomes so difficult to attain sometimes because we're so human. And so that's what I don't want to leave us hopeless about it. Like, I don't know how to fix my heart. I don't know how to love my husband better when he's not been everything I hoped he would be today, yesterday, the day before. You know, I don't know how to do that. But if we go back to the true reason of why we love others, which is John, 1 John 10 and 11. First John, it's not 10 and 11. First John 1, 10 and 11, I think. I was real early this morning. Maybe it's three. It's going to be gone, isn't it? Here in his love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought also to love one another. The reason that we are able to go on when we've been hurt, when we've been discouraged, when we've not known how to do it right, when we have filled other people's love tanks of their life up and we feel empty, the reason we can go on is because of Jesus Christ and because God loved us first. And he was the propitiation, which what that means is God looked at Jesus Christ as the absolute ability to um, be atonement, to wipe away every sin that I had. When God looked down, Jesus Christ became the sin and was it was washed away. So that sin isn't even looked at. The sacrifice that Jesus made, when we feel so tired of maybe making sacrifices of our hearts and our lives and our efforts, that Jesus made such a bigger sacrifice for us, loving us, that no matter what, that we would be able to be loved by God and share that love wherever we go. Wherever. And continuously give out that love. To be able to continue when we feel empty. When we feel like there's just not a whole lot left that I can give. I feel pretty hurt myself and maybe somebody else should be helping me. But you know what? Instead of looking like that, I'm going to go look at the cross and I'm going to see that Jesus Christ paid the ultimate sacrifice for me and still is giving to me every morning when I get up. His mercies are new every day. When I feel empty and so grief-stricken, I don't know how I'm going to go on. Jesus Christ on the cross is the reason that I get up every day and say I love Him because He first loved me. Amen. I'm going to read a song that won't go with what Mom's playing. But... 
No, I imagine. I, I couldn't. I, I mean, I, I, I didn't know it well enough. But I just want to read the words to it because this is what the reason we do it. Mama dragged us to church every Sunday, and heaven knows I didn't want to go. The preacher talked too long, and I didn't like those songs. That hour and 15 went by way too slow. When I asked my mother, why do we bother? She smiled and said from deep down in her soul, love is the reason. Love is the reason. Love is the reason that I go, standing up for what I believe in. That's where my heart is leading, and love is the reason that I go. Time went by and we got a little older. My brother signed up to wear that army green, fighting the good fight and leaving home behind, giving everything to be all he could be. And I asked my brother, why do you bother? He stood up tall and he said these words to me, love is the reason, love is the reason. Yes, love is the reason that I go. I'm going to fight for what I believe in. That's where my heart is leading, and love is the reason that I go. Love is strong. Love is kind. Love will go the extra mile, and it ain't scared to pay the price. Love will always sacrifice. But this is what, when this song told this story, it came down to the very reason that we exist. Walking up that hill that stood before him, carrying that cross to bear our shame. If I could ask him why he was laying down his life, I know that I would hear my Jesus say, love is the reason. Love is the reason. Yes, love is the reason that I go. I'll give my life for what I believe in. That's where my heart is leading. And love is the reason that I go. Love is the reason that I go. Mac Powell sang that song and I heard it and I thought, that story of why we do what we do, why a mama takes her kids to church sometimes when it gets old, why soldiers are fighting for us, but the real reason for what we need to share with everyone that we come in contact with, the TLC, the tender loving care. The real reason is because Jesus Christ is everything. He gave everything for us. He loved us beyond anything that we could ever have. The person that's loved you the most in your whole life doesn't love you as much as Jesus Christ. He wants you to be just as close and just as in love with him as he is with you. He wants you to realize that even if you keep giving out love, that there's more that you can receive from him. Don't hold it up. Hold your hand up against being refilled by the very love that keeps you going. Keep asking when you get down to pray and you seek the Lord and you ask Him for help. Don't be discouraged because He hasn't moved yet and feel like, you know, not only did my heart get stomped by the people I tried to show love to, but my heart feels a little stomped because I'm still sick or my husband's still not saved or things still aren't the way I wanted them to go. And so I'm going to turn my heart off a little bit to you too, Jesus, because you didn't do it the way I thought it would go. I didn't think my daddy was going to pass away when we asked for healing. Till the end. I knew then, but it didn't go the way I wanted, Lord. So you turn your heart off a little. When the truth is, is the Lord did it the right way. Whatever he did, however he did it, we may not see it, we may not understand it, but when he got up on that cross and allowed them to nail his hands and feet, he did it out of love for us and he sees it all and he knows exactly what you need to be able to serve him however he wants you to. And if you're willing, if we're willing to follow the word, because that's what it also said in 1 John. Hereby we perceive we hereby perceive we the love of God because he laid down his life for us. And we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. But he also said in 1 John 2, and I am closing, Sister Linda, thank you. 1 John chapter 2, 3 through 6. 
This is going to be tough. Sometimes things in the Word are a little tough to swallow. And hereby we do know that we know Him if we keep His commandments. He that saith, I know Him, and keepeth not His commandments, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoso keepeth His word, in him verily is the love of God perfected. Hereby know we that we are in Him. He that saith he abideth in him ought himself also to walk, so to walk, even as he walked. What Jesus wants, I don't know that John meant that we are big liars because we say something and we're not following. I think maybe what he meant, at least when I read it this morning, is we tend to lie to ourselves that everything's okay. And we're doing the best we can anyway. And I don't know that I could follow everything. But the Lord isn't asking you to pick this up and assimilate it completely. He's asking you to pick it up and piece by piece begin applying it to your life. A little bit at a time. It's going to change you. And if you're willing for it to change you, and you're willing to walk in His ways, then you're going to be exactly what He wants you to be. Loving Him. Being able to love others. And that's what the Word of God does. Sometimes when we're so full or we've been so loved, we don't realize that others haven't and we don't know how to give. But the more you read the Word, the more you apply it to your heart, the more you care about knowing who Jesus is, the things that are not important anymore, like the sins and the things that don't follow this Word, they start going away. You realize, I don't care that much about that anymore because I've, it's replaced with love. And then you can give it out more because people see you and say, that's what happened when they turned on the first time that Mama was singing, He Touched Me With Us. It was the middle of the song and we turned it to where we, she was sitting with us. We turned it to where we could, they could see her. And she began singing with us. And all of a sudden, a whole trajectory of our ministry changed. Because whatever she had in her, somebody saw that I could be loved. And she is so loving of God. I maybe could be that. And that's what Jesus Christ wants to do for each one of us. Put it in our heart. And has done. But he wants it to be a greater place. In our lives because we're serving the Lord. We're reading his word. We're trying to be the best we can to follow him. And we're laying aside the hurt. I'm going to give you an opportunity. If there's things in there. You've been hurt and you've turned off. You've been afraid. You've been grieving. You've been sinning. And it's kept you away. Whatever it may be. There is a deeper place for all of us to find Jesus' tender love and care. And in order to find that, sometimes we have to admit to ourselves, I've just been going through the care. I'm just going through the motions. But I need some more of the tender and the love. And the person I can get it from is at this altar. Or in my heart, and I can call on him anytime you want to come pray this morning, you can consider things that you may want to just give to Jesus at this altar. If you want to kneel at your seat or pray at your seat, just know this. The tender love and care of Jesus Christ is here this morning and he's offering help if you need it.